Okay, Tim, I have a question for you. God, you know, after like more than 400 episodes, I shouldn't be surprised by these questions. And today, like about a lot of other days, I don't know. I'm not exactly sure what you have in mind. So, <laughs> so okay. You so should what's be up, scared, Kurt? Tim. You should I'm be not... scared. I, All right. Yeah. Here's the question. All right. Okay. When you travel or you find yourself maybe in some public space, do you speak to the strangers who are around you? Like, do you talk to that person sitting next to you on a plane or in the terminal or on the train or the bus? Do you talk to strangers? Okay. Okay. I think I see where you're headed with this. <laughs> um, my answer is this. Sometimes. 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 sometimes I just feel like I need to get outside myself and be in the world and connect with people. Uh, or it looks like there might be some something interesting about another person or a couple. And, and I do reach out. However, at other times I can feel a little neurotic and just kind of keep to myself. How about you? Um, mostly no, um, oh, most okay. mostly no, which is really <laughs> okay. sad because we, we you know the research. Talked, I, I I know the research, and and we're going to talk about that. But sometimes, I, it, so here's here's actually Tim, and we've done this actually. We've 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 done this um, ourselves. I find that if I'm in a Lyft or an Uber, I I find it easier to talk with that person. I don't know why, but it is one of those. It's like, mm. hey, how's the day going? Oh, is it okay. busy? Is it not busy? And then we get into whatever conversation. I was just out in Denver uh, and riding to Boulder and had a wonderful, wonderful conversation with the Lyft driver for 35, 40 minutes and talking about, you know, his his life and where he's moved and where, you know, all of the things I do. It's, yeah. it's fascinating because those right. are wonderful, right. but I don't do it in many other situations. So even though I know the science. Yeah. Do, do you ever think you're going to be creepy when you talk to a stranger? Well, I am creepy. We we know that. So that that's a <laughs> no, given. You're not. Um, no, you're not. no, no. I it, it's, I don't think it's the creepy part. I, I think it's the the situation. I don't know. I I, I, I don't know why I don't know well, what ever, I know. Yeah. Have you ever had a bad experience? Like have you ever tried to talk to a, a Lyft driver or an Uber driver and had a terrible response? I've had like been shut down responses. I think I've oh. had responses that are, I do remember one plane ride where I was like, you like, God, shut up person next to me. You just keep talking and talking and talking about your life that I don't really care about because it's boring. But that was, <laughs> that was 25 years ago. And, oh, you know, okay. every other conversation I've had with anybody else has always been, I mean, they're not, fantastic all the time but they're they're good what about you what so where are you landing on that yeah i i think that uh i bend on the knees of curiosity that that is what kind of makes it interesting you know you, you mentioned the boring thing we can have boring conversations if we let them be boring but we can use <laughs> our own minds to engage and to ask interesting questions and i think i think that's kind of what this is about right Right. And, 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 and if we, so to, to bring listeners into why we're having these dumb yes. questions and then, well, they're yes. not dumb questions. They're good questions. Why we're having these questions is because this very issue, this talking with strangers, uh, was studied in a great paper from almost 10 years ago, right? Called yeah. Mistakenly Seeking Solitude. And it was co-authored by Nick Epley, a University of Chicago psychologist who we first spoke to in episode 287 back in April of 2022. So you would think that I would have wow. learned by now, Tim. It's been <laughs> yeah. almost two plus years and I still haven't learned, right? And now, more than 10 years after he wrote the paper, we wanted to ask him what he thought about the study and his body of work. And he summed it up with a big paradoxical observation. The thing that makes us the happiest and arguably the healthiest uh, in our lives are social connections, interacting with other people, connecting with other people in positive ways, reaching out and engaging with them, whether it's strangers or family or friends colleagues, coworkers, whatever, we are fundamentally social beings who are made happier and healthier by connecting with others. And yet there's also 
preceding pretty much any social interaction we ever have, often some anxiety about actually doing that, right? So there are all these opportunities for social connection that we then avoid. We don't talk to strangers on the train or a plane or on a bus or a cab, right? Now, this might seem obvious at first, but reflect on it just the slightest little bit, and it gets you wondering, what might a conversation with a stranger lead to? Like, what am I missing out on by not talking to people that I don't know? What richness in life lies just beyond our anxieties? What if we had just a simple conversation or we asked a simple question of someone we don't know? Conversations a two-way street goes back and forth, right? And you by taking an interest, can make lots of things better. So, so you start telling me about your boring trip to the grocery store, and then I ask where you live, and I ask, have you always wanted to live there? And you say, no, I've always wanted to be a monk on the Amalfi Coast in a monastery. I say, really? What led you to want to do that? And you say, well, you know, I got this childhood experience. You know, and then, and then we're off to the races, and you're not telling me about the story to the grocery store. And that is exactly my experience when I do engage with somebody in public space, that the conversation is almost never boring, except for that one time on the plane, right? That that one time <laughs> 25 years ago. And right. yet, and yet, you know, it still comes there. And it's not boring, as you mentioned earlier, Tim, as long as I'm curious. Yeah. And Nick says that once you start doing it, it can be very fulfilling. Once you realize that that other people are more sociable. They're friendlier, they're nicer, they're more interesting, they're more willing to engage, they reciprocate your outreach more, they reach back more than you would guess. Once you realize that, you start looking for this more. You take an interest in other people more. You see opportunities to engage and connect. Uh, you see opportunities to reach out in ways that other people reach back. The world becomes a brighter place. Ah, a brighter place. Who doesn't want that? <laughs> Who doesn't want a brighter place? So it's a good life lesson to not only be kind to strangers, but to talk to them. You never know. You just never know what kind of wonderful things might happen. Yeah. What good things might happen to you? Yeah. Ah, yeah, to you. And by the way, Nick is not just a psych professor. He is the John Templeton Keller Distinguished Service Professor at of behavioral science, and he's also the faculty director of the Roman Family Center for Decision Research at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. And that part about the Roman Family Center for Decision Research, we wanted to talk to him about that too, because they're doing something really cool in a research facility called MindWorks. Ah, yeah. Well, I ran into Nick at a gathering in, uh, at MindWorks in Chicago a couple of months ago, and I got to see the MindWorks facilities firsthand. It's a beautiful space in the Exchange Building on Michigan Avenue in downtown Chicago. It's right across the street from the Art Institute of Chicago, and it's right next door to where the Chicago Symphony Orchestra performs. It's a well-trafficked location, and it's really quite a fantastic space. And the location is really important. It's an important part of the story for what makes MindWork special. The MindWork team facilitates thousands of experiments every year. Thousands! In Thousands and the experiments, thousands. thousands of experiments in this really cool space. And they host experiments in psychology, robotics, computer science, leadership, all sorts of things. And they rely on people walking in off of the street, just curious passersby who think it might be interesting. And because of their location, they get a really interesting set of demographics in these studies. In our conversation with Nick, we covered his observations on this fantastic paradox of our need to be social and our reluctance to engage in it, as well as some of the work that MindWorks is doing. And as you listen to Nick's compelling findings, you might find yourself thinking a bit more about talking to strangers, maybe even talking to strangers today. <laughs> Laying a nice little lead there. I like that, Kurt. Okay, so start today, but but not right now. <laughs> no, minute. listen to the conversation that we're having first. <laughs> exactly. And uh, but then, to get you, and then to get you, do that. yeah, to get you ready, uh, we yeah. invite you to sit back in a comfortable chair with a straight up pour of your favorite conversation with strangers, and enjoy our conversation with Nick Epley. Nick Epley, welcome back to Behavioral Grooves. 
Thanks, Tim. It's great fun to be here with you guys again. A couple of months ago, Nick, we ran into each other at uh, BDRM in Chicago, and yep. you were starting to tell me a little bit about MindWorks because we were in this gorgeous facility that MindWorks is in. Mm -hmm. So we want to share with our listeners, like, what is going on? Like, what what is MindWorks and what makes it different and how did it get started? There's a whole bunch of things we want to cover today. But yeah. first of all, tell us, what is MindWorks and, and who and who runs it? Yeah, so um, so I'm a professor at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, and I'm the faculty director of what's known as the Roman Family Center for Decision Research. The Center for Decision Research has been in existence since the 1970s when Robin Hogarth and Hillel Einhorn started this center in the business school dedicated to behavioral science, to decision sciences. At the time, this was one of the only places on the planet that had psychologists employed in the business school interfacing with economists and sociologists and the other disciplines that work uh, in, in the business world. And we have been chugging along uh, effectively with wonderful faculty here. Richard Thaler came in the mid-1990s and was faculty director for 20 years for the center. We've heard of him. Yeah. Yeah. You know that guy. Uh, <laughs> Once or twice I've heard his name. Yeah, yeah. He's done some good work. Um, <laughs> and uh, he was faculty director through, I don't know, 2015 or something like that, 20 years. And built the center mostly around faculty who were who were here doing research and and the center supported research that faculty were doing as we added more faculty richard was gaining a lot of notor notoriety and was doing work that was impacting policy all around the world the center grew and got bigger and we were able to do some different different things than we were able to do otherwise and one of the big things we were able to do was to reach out into the world to find people who were interested in participating in our experiments in ways that we weren't really able to do before. So the central challenge for any psychologist or behavioral scientist or behavioral economist working today as a researcher is finding people to participate in our experiments. And there are a number of different ways we solve that problem. Sometimes we just go out and watch people. They don't know that they're in experiments. We just observe them or we get existing data that's out there. Those aren't ideal because we can't run the experiments that we want to run that allow us to differentiate cause and effect. So typically what we're then doing is we're trying to run an experiment. And that involves bringing people to some, some place or meeting people where they are to run them through some world that we create for them, that we put them under different conditions to look at how this affects some variable we care about. Often, university researchers will do this in the basement of their university building somewhere <laughs> with university undergrads, and we all understand that's not a very good way to build a behavioral science. These, these are affectionately known as labs, right? <laughs> these are labs, yes. These are laboratories, and laboratories have their place. They are wonderful for getting very tight control under the conditions we want to study people under, but they're less good for saying that this highly stylized experiment works with a wide range of people out there in the world and places where we care about. So starting in about 2005 and 2006, when we got here, when I got here to the University of Chicago, we started looking outside the lab for ways we could run experiments out in the world with real people. And MindWorks is really the culmination of that 20 years of research effort to get out in the world. And what MindWorks yeah. now is, is, as far as I know, the only behavioral science discovery center of its kind on the planet that I know of. It's like a museum of science and industry here in Chicago, but just <laughs> for behavioral science. And it's not just a space where you can come to learn about the field, go through some demonstrations about, that'll tell you something about how the mind works. But it's also a place where you can come to actually participate in research. It is a lab. It is a legit lab. Um, and so we've taken the lab out of the basement of the building and moved it out in the world where folks who are visiting Chicago can come in for free and stop by and get some swag while benefiting science. 
And do they have to like go way off the beaten path? Do they need to, you know, uh, is no. this is this kind of one of these remote spots no. that was in a cheap strip mall somewhere? <laughs> we looked into some of those <laughs> and the finances were certainly better there, but the traffic was not. No, no, this is definitely not off the beaten path. This is on Michigan Avenue. It's at 224 South Michigan Avenue in Chicago. It is right across the street from the Art Institute. So if you are visiting our fair uh, windy city of Chicago. Uh, we would love love to see you there. Okay, so it's in a busy part of town, and it's it's this multidisciplinary thing. Like it's you, it's a museum, it's a lab, it's a place where experiments are run, but also a place where you're highlighting experiments. So you've got these multi prong. Uh, sort of objectives that you're trying to accomplish, it sounds like, right? In some ways, you're trying to educate people, but in some ways, you're also trying to use them as guinea pigs for for experiments. Is that is that fair? Yeah, I wouldn't use the term guinea pig. Okay, um, okay. <laughs> in part because what, what, what I've learned over 20 years, this actually started when I was in Boston at Harvard, my first faculty job, with my amazing PhD students there at the time, people like... Um, like Jesse Preston and Kerry Morwedge and and Kurt Gray, they're just we we just we knew we weren't going to build a science out of undergrad Harvard undergrads, and so we started going out in the world. There, we would go to South Station in Boston or to the Museum of Science in in Boston, the Children's Museum in particular in Boston, because we wanted to get parents and their kids. And so we learned that you could go to where people are to have them participate in research. And what we also learned is that people are really curious about this. And they're really interested. And we can create product, frankly. You can think about an experiment as a, as a product that people want to experience. Wow. It's not like we're injecting them with some drug. <laughs> we're running them through right. something. And then at the end, we're telling them what we're doing and why we're doing it. And that's the part. That's the part that's really interesting. So from the very start, we have focused very hard. If, if I'm going to take your time with me in an experiment, I'm going to make it worth your while. And I'm yeah. not going to make it worth your while because I'm paying you for it. You don't really come to do this because you want money. You're sitting in South Station in Boston. You're bored out of your damn mind, right? You want to do something <laughs> interesting, right? Um, you're curious. And so what we have to offer is satisfying some curiosity. That's the value proposition. Um, and so we we try to make the experience that people have rewarding for them and satisfying their curiosity. Yeah. So, so this allows you to, to have some partnerships then. So with like museums yes. and city governments and those places where, okay, there could be an opportunity here that you can bring in this element that's actually fun for people, yeah. um, a little bit educational for them as well, uh, that, that does this. So is that part of the the entirety of of how you guys are structuring Mindworks with partnerships and different things? So Mindworks is is much more of our independent effort to do this on our own. Okay. Um, but for the 20 years that preceded it, we were out doing partnerships that cost precisely zero dollars for us nice. to do. And so in Boston, the Children's Museum, South Station, we would look, you know, to find where people are, where are people out in the world sitting, potentially able or interested to do something with us, whether it be have a conversation or fill out a survey or evaluate some product, whatever it might be, um, where we could go out and and reach them. And that was, and then and then you have to partner with those places, the people running those those spots. Typically, these are security personnel. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes there are other places. So I worked with Metra. Some of some of the experiments we did 10 years or so ago that we published were about people talking to each other on trains. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. it was the marketing group at, um, at Metra, the train uh, line in Chicago that we needed to connect to. When we went to Midway Airport, it was the security personnel who were sitting outside that needed to make sure that we were we, they were okay with us going there. Sometimes it's city governments. So in the city uh, of Chicago, there is um, uh, we are connected to the mayor's office and have permission from them to run experiments in the city's city's parks um, because we they know we provide positive value to visitors and tourists who are wanting to participate. We work in the Lincoln Park Zoo sometimes, the Garfield mm -hmm. Park Conservatory, mm -hmm. where people are. Typically, there are people who are interested in having us come and do something. So I. 
I can see that going to those places, you're going to sort of uh, be involved with uh, particular populations. And I guess the question is, when you're located at 224 Michigan Avenue, right across from the Art Institute, are you get what the the kind of people that are walking in off the street? Are you getting good data by having that particular population walk in off the street? So you, we can never really assess that in a way that is perfectly satisfying. And so what researchers, what we try to do is is we assess a few metrics that we that we can satisfy. We, clearly, this is not a, a representative sample of humanity, right? But that's not what we're trying to do. Actually, we okay, we are typically in our experiments. We're we're trying to manipulate, experimentally manipulate or vary some conditions, and then randomly assign people into those two conditions, yeah. right? And so. You know the the feature of your population is not going to explain the differences between those two conditions. It could be the case, though, that you've got something unique about this particular population that makes this particular variable work differently for them than it does for others. And we can certainly imagine imagine how that works. And there are those effects. I think it's easy to overestimate the size of those effects. I mean, look, the the world of medicine has made extraordinary gains. Our, our daughter went through a bout of ovarian cancer last spring. She's great and now. And I mean, the miracles that doctors are able to do because they have randomly assigned non-representative samples of human beings who have bodies that largely work the same mm -hmm. to one condition or another is astonishing. And psychologists are trying to do the yeah. same thing. And it's true that minds work a little differently from one person to another, no doubt. But there's also a lot of shared humanity, too. Right. So, yeah. The samples that we get are not perfect. The question is, can they be better? And the sample yeah. that we samples of people that we get walking in off of Michigan Avenue, for instance, are better, I would say, in lots of ways than you know undergraduates from the University of Chicago <laughs> who might come into our lab who are much <laughs> the narrower. The basement, the basement of a university yeah, yeah, that right? has it's yeah, you're the, getting the, the psychology universities classes. on the planet, right? That's not yeah. that that is a yeah. that is an especially narrow slice of humanity. Right, who might be particularly unique for some of the things we're doing. But you know, look, when we have folks come come in off of Michigan Avenue, we've got people from you know sixty different countries around the world, mm -hmm. all different yeah. ages of people, from kids to you know folks eighty to ninety years old, you know, all different races and ethnicities and and less socioeconomic diversity than we might uh, enjoy or, or hope hope to get. But it's certainly better. So that's what we're what yeah. we're always trying to do. Can we do better? Can we get something that we have a you know even a little more confidence in in generalizing from? But yeah. that said, any paper any behavioral scientist publishes anymore is going to confront this issue head on in some ways, and is going to have multiple yeah. experiments with a with with as kind of diverse uh, uh, sample samples as we can get from one experiment to another that allows us to build a, a case for an for an effect. <laughs> So, Nick, what kind of experiments are you guys doing at MindWorks? What are the, if I was to walk in off of the street, what could I participate in on any given day or, you know, as we're moving forward? You could talk to your romantic partner about something deep and meaningful and important to you. You could talk. Oh, God, no. <laughs> I'm staying away from that one. I, I want to. That, that is definitely one. We, do, we run a lot of, we do run a lot of social interaction studies. Yeah. Um, because we have lots of people coming in. It's hard to, it's hard to get people to come together and talk to each other. And so this is a perfect venue, venue for that. We've done lots of experiments like that. Um, you might come in and, you know, we'd, we'd present you a bunch of gifts and you have to, you have to get one for somebody you came in with oh. like that. We might have you participate in a virtual reality experiment. So we, we have folks who are doing virtual reality experiments. You might, um, you might put your, we might put you in a boardroom um, of a Fortune 500 firm and have you make some, you know, C-suite level decisions about how this company might function. Um, we might have you do some math problems that seem frustrating, but tell an interesting and important point. We might have you fill out some surveys, evaluating different products. I think the bigger question is, isn't what, what do we do there, but rather what don't we do? Yeah. That's the, so tell us what you don't do. So what we don't yeah. do are the things that 
we often do in the labs on campus. And what we do in the labs and campus are really long and boring experiments. <laughs> like, you know, you know, where you're pushing buttons for an hour and we're measuring your reaction time to something, or you're, you know, wearing an eye tracker and we're watching where you look at different things and, and it and it requires a lot of complexity to calibrate those things. Those experiments definitely have their place in the field, but for somebody who's just out trying to find something interesting to do, that place is not not mind work. So <laughs> what we try to do are run experiments that after you're done, you'll find to be interesting. Um, so, what's the, so what's the scale like, Nick? Is it, uh, do you do one experiment a day, one a week? You know, give, give, give us a feel for how frequently you're running experiments and how many experiments you can get through in a particular period of time. So what I can do is uh, I'm folks on the podcast won't be able to see this, but I'm holding up a report <laughs> okay. um, that I get every week from from the staff at MindWorks and Amy Boonstra, our executive director in the Roman Family Center for Decision Research, hands this to me. And that report every week lists the number of folks who came through, the percentage who participated in experiments, and also the experiments that we're running. So I can just tell you what we did this last week. Um, we are open Perfect. from Wednesday through Sunday. Right now, we experiment a little bit with hours, but we're closed on Mondays and Tuesdays because the Art Institute is, and we need to give people a breather. We had 420 folks come through MindWorks in those days, so that's pretty good yeah. numbers. Um, we, uh, we had, of those 420, we had 146 adults and 71 minors participate in experiments. So those are conversion rates of about 50%, 60%. Mm -hmm. So typically we have a little over half of the folks who come in to, to the space, to MindWorks, also be interested in participating in experiments that we're running. And if you participate in an experiment with us, you earn points. So we don't have cash on hand for obvious reasons. We, we don't want to be a, a bank that can be robbed. If we were to be robbed, they'd walk out with a whole bunch of books and squishy rubber foam brains. <laughs> they would get and a lot of signed uh, Richard yes, Taylor books exactly. and Nick Epley books. Exactly. And yeah, there a you bunch go. of mind yeah. works for these. So I think we'd catch them. Um, so you come in and you earn points for participating depending on how long you spend with us. And as you accrue those points, uh, you can walk out with mind works swags from keychains okay. to mugs to whatever. So so we're looking and, and we're running every day we're running experiments there that faculty at the University of Chicago or elsewhere. We also will run experiments for folks outside of the University of Chicago too. We view this as sort of a public service to the field in many ways. Um, right now we've got 10 different experiments running there right now that the wow. research assistants are running. And these are versions of you know, elaborate virtual reality studies, studies with kids that are that only the the younger folks can do um, things on iPads. Folks might do so. It's, it's all kinds of different, all kinds of different experiments going on at once. I love the variety. I, I love that that this one space is doing is supporting all of this at the same time. And then, yep. if if we were to talk in a month, I would assume that the the raft of of experiments that you're running is completely different as well. Yeah, for sure. These turn over pretty fast. We run people through them pretty quickly because we have so many visitors. And for a for a researcher, that that ability to run lots of people quickly is wonderful because it means you got better quality control on your research. The research mm -hmm. assistants who are running the experiments are well trained on it. They've been doing it repeatedly. And so so it's not like you've got a week or two gap but you know, running people through the experiment where folks forget what they're supposed to be doing or whatever. This is a very well-oiled machine. And because we're running experiments that are interesting to people, we can we can invite folks from all around the University of Chicago's campus, psych department, law school, computer science. Sarah Sebo is one of our relatively newer faculty in the University of Chicago in, in computer science who runs experiments where you interact with robots in MindWorks. And you know, she is able to, to to have people participate in her experiments at a rate that she'd never be able to do if we were waiting for folks to walk into the lab on campus. Do you have a favorite experiment that's been run there? I mean, one that just kind of stands out for you? Or is that picking like a favorite kid? That, uh, so the problem is, is that is it, 
it's picking one of my experiments, right? Because <laughs> I'll remember what I did, not necessarily what uh, what all of my colleagues did, which are super interesting, right? So no, no, yeah. they're not. They're not that interesting. Your work right, is definitely more interesting. interesting. Okay, fine. Yeah. Uh, you said it, Tim. Not not me. Um, you said it. So so I can tell you the ones that the visitors really like. Um, there you go. They like Tim Hubbard's virtual reality experiments. Tim's a psychologist at Notre Dame, and we can get into okay. why we've got Notre Dame faculty in uh, MindWorks in just a minute, I suppose. So Tim is a psychologist at, uh, at Notre Dame in the business school, and he's the one who runs the virtual reality experiments where you're making CEO-level decisions for Fortune 500 firms. And those are just cool, right? The technology is neat. And yeah. so we've got enough space where we can set up a whole room that we dedicate to Tim's virtual reality studies. Uh, they like Sarah Sibo's experiments where they're interacting with these, you know, futuristic sorts of robots who are talking to them, that they're having conversations with them. And that's, wow. that's super cool. And they do also like the experiments we run where people talk to each other. Um, in fact, they like those more than they would expect, which is kind of one of the <laughs> four findings that we have consistently that conversation tends to go better that with strangers in particular than people often often expect it to and um, in, in one experiment this is I'll tell you one that I like a lot that we did and this was with a former postdoc of mine Quinn Hershey who's now working with uh, morning consult in Chicago she and I ran an experiment where we looked to see what what power do you have as a listener to make a conversation with a stranger? essentially interesting, right? So we, and so what we did was we we varied the topic of conversation, what, what you were talking about, and we also varied the approach you took to it as a listener, whether you tried to be interested in what the person was saying or not, okay? And so we had people in this experiment assigned to the role of a speaker and a listener, so we were having a conversation, but one person was kind of in the lead. And we had the speaker come up with either a really interesting story to tell the listener or a really boring story, like the most, you know, most boring story you could think of. Tell me about the route you take to your grocery store. <laughs> or, or like anything that Tim talks about. So that would be, you, said you know, you just bring Tim in and have him be the storyteller all the time. Uh, so, so we have that. We got, the, we got the speaker with an interesting story or boring story. And then we tell the listener, okay, what we want you to do is either be as interested as you can possibly be in this story or just listen as you normally do. And they're only in one of those conditions. So they, they don't hear about right. all the other conditions like I just told you. They just hear about one of them. So okay. listeners told to be interested or to just listen as they normally Okay, They anticipate how these conversations are going to go. They then have the conversation, and afterwards they report how, it, how the experience actually went. Turns out that taking an interested approach as a listener to a boring story leads to a conversation that you enjoy just as much as listening to the speaker tell an interesting story. Wow. And people didn't quite guess that. You have, as a listener, you've got the power to make somebody's really boring story, frankly, interesting. <laughs> so so I'm sure that you have some hypothesis on why mm -hmm. that is. What what are you what are you thinking? Why does that why does taking an interest, even in a boring story, make it so it isn't as boring. So we are obviously trying to figure that out right now. And so this is a, a long process of research discovery. I, I will tell you that that who it really mattered the most for in, in a way they didn't anticipate were the speakers too. So the speakers, the listeners thought they had some power to do this. They still underestimated how much power they actually had to make a boring story interesting, but they had some sense that they could make it better by listening carefully. The speakers didn't think it would matter. Speakers thought it was wow. all on them, and they were just really wrong about that. Wow. They enjoyed telling a boring story to an interested <laughs> listener just as much as they enjoyed telling their interesting story. And um, I think what happens is that the interested listener changes the story. That That's it, what it is. It's not magical. Mm -hmm. It's magical in the sense that we don't anticipate this result, but it's not magical in the sense that when you take an interest – you find things to be interested in and you therefore ask about those things and you make the story better. Conversations a two-way street goes back and forth, right? And you, by taking an interest, can make lots of things better. So, so you start telling me about your boring trip to the grocery store and then I ask where you live 
And I ask, have you always wanted to live there? And you say, no, I've always wanted to be a monk on the Amalfi Coast in a monastery. I say, really? What led you to want to do that? And you say, well, you know, I got this childhood experience, you know, and then and then we're off to the races. And you're not telling me about the story to the grocery store. Yeah. I, I that's love what that. I think has happened. We don't know that for sure, but that's what I think has happened. So I, I think that that's fantastic that you're learning this. And to bring it back to MindWorks, to what degree do you think you would have gotten similar data uh, and 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 uncovered the same kinds of observations if you didn't have MindWorks, if you didn't have people literally just coming in off of Michigan Avenue? So what we would have done instead would have been to go either to campus or maybe out out in the world somewhere like in, in a park. So we, we got to, for an experiment like that one, you got to bring people together to talk. And that's hard to do. It's yeah. hard to get. Yeah. I think it's easy. It's hard to try to do. It's hard to find a lot, you know, and we need like 400 pairs of people to talk. Yeah. And the way we would do that now, the way behavioral scientists are doing that now is we go online uh, mm -hmm. and we have people talk like we're talking now over a video chat and whatnot. And, and that's wonderful. That's great in lots of ways. But those populations in many ways are even less representative, even more unusual or weird than the folks that we would have walking off the street. Those folks that we would get online are often career participants. They do this for a living. Yeah. It's somewhat shocking, but they'll do this for a living. And so, you know, Kurt and Tim, you might, if you're doing this for a living, you might have done a thousand of these. Wow. How much attention are you paying to this thing? How well versed are you in the art of filling out a survey without really even thinking about it? So I think, <laughs> I think what we get from experiments that we run at MindWorks is faith. Yeah. We have, we have confidence. We have faith that the data that we are getting are from people who are paying attention. They are real living human beings. They're not bots. Uh, they're not career participants who are filling out some party line that they know. They're, they haven't learned what the results of the experiment ought to be through some, some separate chat. Um, that they've been vo involved in for this. These are real people who are doing these experiments for the first time, giving us genuine, authentic responses to this experience. And they're paying attention. Yeah. They're paying attention. The attention, so we have ways as researchers of checking whether you are paying attention to what you're doing or, or doing this mindlessly. And when we run those attention checks at MindWorks, um, they're amazingly good. People are really paying attention in ways that they're not necessarily in other places. So, so I have faith, if I see an effect in an experiment of mine works, I believe it in yeah. a way that I don't necessarily or that I might have doubts about if somebody sends me some prolific or mechanical Turk uh, sample, which yeah. is where researchers are often going now. Hey, this is Kurt, and we want to say thanks for listening to Behavioral Grooves, and we hope that you're enjoying this episode. But it feels a little bit one-sided. You're hearing from us, but we're not hearing from you. This is Tim, and we have two suggestions to remedy that. The first is join our Facebook page and engage with us. We want to talk with you. We want to hear your perspectives, and hopefully our Facebook page might be the place to have some of that interaction. So please, please come and join us. The other recommendation we have for you is to leave us a quick rating. You know, the little five-star thing at the bottom of your app? or a short review. Just leave us a few words about what you like about behavioral groups. We very much appreciate it. Thanks, and we now return you to our regularly scheduled programming. I mean, it sounds fantastic. And, and like Tim said, he met you at the BDRM, which was hosted there, right? So you even use the space for other kind of gatherings and, and various different... Uh, Absolutely. We view MindWorks primarily as a space to help us advance our, our research. And we do that by creating a space that people are interested in coming in and by giving a product, namely our experiments, that people are interested in participating in and learning something from. We also give out sweatshirts and swag, um, <laughs> which they turn out to like as well. But we really view the, the second thing that we view MindWorks as doing for us is, is outreach. Yeah. Creating a more visibility for behavioral science and the research that the entire field is doing, creating a space where, you know, people, when they're coming to Chicago for a, for a conference, say, in the, in the field, can come and gather yep. and hopefully take away some ideas for how they might replicate something like this wherever, wherever they are. Yep. And it, it's a very good space 
communal space for that. Absolutely. It, it'll be interesting. I, I think many of our listeners, when next time they visit Chicago, might just now put this on their itinerary to, hey, I need to go check this place out. And we would encourage that. Nick, I want to switch topics mm-hmm. a little bit. So move away from mine works, move to your work. Yeah. So what what fun new research are you working on? So for the last 10 years or so, this is the first time in my career I've ever I've ever had a big idea, I have to say. Um, <laughs> I've had ideas that are, you know, in papers and, and, and whatnot, but but not one that just sticks with me over and over again and has so many different aspects to it that I keep coming back to it and kind of can't stop thinking about it and, and, and studying different aspects of it. And that idea is, it's not, it's not so much an idea, it's, it's an observation, I would say, which is that there's, there's a, a paradox, I think, really at the core of human life. And that paradox is that the thing that makes us the happiest and argues, arguably the healthiest uh, in our lives are social connections, interacting with other people, connecting with other people in positive ways, reaching out and engaging with them, whether it's strangers or family or friends, colleagues, coworkers, whatever. We are fundamentally social beings who are made happier and healthier by connecting with others. So there's that. And yet there's also preceding pretty much any social interaction we ever have, often some anxiety about actually doing that. Right? So there are all these opportunities for social connection that we then avoid. We don't talk to strangers on the train or a plane or on a bus or a cab, right? We walk down the street of Chicago, we stand at a street corner. We don't smile at the person sitting next to them, right? We, we carry around these tools in our pockets, these cell phones that are supposed to connect us to other people that nevertheless keep us in our own world and keep us from connecting to the people around us. So there's this, there's this paradox. We're, we're fundamentally social and yet we often avoid social interaction. And I've been trying to understand why that paradox seems to exist for about 10 years. And I think I got one one potential answer to it. And that is that we underestimate how positively these interactions are going to go. So our Mm. expectations, the thing that guide our choices, right? If if, if I want to understand why you do something, I don't want to understand how you feel when you do it. I want to understand how you think you'll feel before you do the thing. Because it's those expectations that are guiding your choices, not your actual, because you don't know what your experience is going to be until you have it. But you know what you think it's going to be before you actually have it. And what we find just over and over again in lots of different ways for for somewhat different reasons, that we tend to underestimate how positively these interactions are going to go. We, we underestimate how much we'll enjoy talking with a stranger. We understand, uh, underestimate once we actually are talking with somebody, how, how much we'll enjoy deep and meaningful conversations. Uh, we fail to appreciate just how much we'll having have a, a conversation, say, with somebody who really disagrees with us. About some mm-hmm. uh, about something, we underestimate how positively others will respond when we reach out to express gratitude or give them a compliment or express our support to them. I mean, this has just been a relentless, a relentless finding over and over and over again. And so, I'm now working on a on a book um, describing all of this research, describing our inherent sociality on the one hand, but also our, our social avoidance, our reluctance to engage in sociality on, on the other, and comparing these two things against each other um, in lots of different ways. And um, and that's, that's what I'm working on. That is fantastic stuff. And in my mind, that all comes from just, hey, why don't we just see what the person sitting next to us on the train is up to these days as I'm yeah. commuting? And yeah, well, <laughs> taking an interest certainly helps, right? So that's a, yeah, yeah. that's a big thing. I had a conversation a little while ago. So another thing we do in the Roman Family Center for Decision Research is we, we run a speaker series that's publicly available called Think Better. And I had a conversation with David Brooks a little while ago who wrote a book called How to Know mm-hmm. a Person, which is really, really based quite a bit on some work we've done, but also kind of more broadly. It's a lovely, in, lovely in book. The, yeah, yeah, it's a great book. Yeah. Um, and he's got a he's got a particularly wonderful take on the field that I with I always learn something from because he's an outsider to it. So he's got a different perspective mm-hmm. on it. But he he creates this distinction in this book between illuminators and diminishers, right? That mm-hmm. it's not really that categorical, but you know, there are different kinds of people and different approaches we can take to other people. We can interact with other people in ways that illuminates them, lifts them up, 
shows them some interest, acknowledges them as a person, takes an interest in them, or we can kind of ignore them, treat them as if they don't exist, diminish them, leave them feel, or leave our interactions feeling a little worse, a little darker than they had been before. And one of the things that David noted in our in the conversation that that we had this spring was he's often surprised when he sits down to talk to people. He's been influenced by our research. So he, he talks to strangers now in ways that he hasn't before. He's often surprised by how uncurious and uninterested other people often are in him. So he's, he said he's always worried. He sits down on a plane and he's talking to a Trump supporter or something. And he's always worried about you know, when are they going to turn and ask, hey, what do you do for a living? And he mentions he's a New York Times columnist. And he said that has never happened to him. Oh, um, yeah. I don't find it to be quite that way. I find people do take an interest when you give them opportunity. Nevertheless, that is that is there. And so when you walk around the world, just that, you know, in the experiment I described to you a bit ago about the power of taking an interest in a boring story, even. Yeah. Once you realize that that other people are more sociable, they're friendlier, they're nicer, they're more interesting, they're more willing to engage, they reciprocate your outreach more, they reach back more than you would guess. Once you realize that, you start looking for this more. You take an interest in other people more. You see opportunities to engage and connect. You see opportunities to reach out in ways that other people reach back. The world becomes a brighter place. It's really yeah. powerful. So there's a learned behavior part of this as, as you're seeing. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And, and, and one of the problems with our expectations is that they can sometimes inhibit our learning. Mm. Right. Yeah. And there are particular kind of beliefs that really are self-fulfilling and inhibit our learning more than others. So it turns out that, uh, and you can think this through and figure out why this is the case pretty quickly. Avoidance is self-fulfilling. Yeah. If, you know, pessimism is self-fulfilling. If I believe you're not going to be interesting to talk to, I won't talk to you. I'll never find out I could be wrong. Optimism could be corrected. Pessimism cannot, right? Oh, yeah. man. And oh, so yeah. that that pushes for a pessimistic bias, I think, in our social interactions. And it's it's not the case that, you know, any every interaction you have is wonderful or, you know, certainly anything like that, that every time you reach out and compliment somebody or express gratitude, it, it's always, always great. But But you learn what it's like. And you calibrate your expectations through experience. Uh, and one of the reasons why our expectations don't get calibrated is because they keep us from having experiences. Yeah. It's interesting. We have talked with a number of people who have referenced your research in not only the books that they've written, but in, you know, even the conversations. And, and what you talked about at the very beginning about this idea that you know, our social connections and the well, how, how good those are, are a big influence on our overall well-being, health, a variety of other factors that's been shown, again, numerous times through lots of different research that I, I believe that hopefully your work is driving um, more interest in that, and at least that's what we're seeing, and that hopefully you can actually have an impact on uh, you know, at, at a scalable level, uh, which is where I find this really fascinating and really interesting. I hope so. I hope so. I have to say, though, that that's not something that I pursue really hard myself. Mm. Uh, I learned a couple of decades ago that it's hard to be a missionary for, for the <laughs> field. Some people are really good at it. Richard Taylor is amazingly good at this. Yeah. Although, you know, Richard was really good at kind of introducing a methodology and approach to policy that people jumped on very, very quickly. He wasn't pushing a particular finding. He was pushing an approach to doing research and thinking about behavior change and intervention. And, but, you know, I don't, I find it hard to go out beating a drum, telling people to interact more in, in, in part, because what I'm trying to do is figure this stuff out. And, and, yeah. and that whole effort to, to, to create interventions or have mass impact is just a separate thing. But I do think that, you know, that behavioral science at its best creates wisdom for people. It finds, it doesn't confirm common sense. There's just not, there's no value, not a lot of value for us in doing that. What we can do as behavioral science is we can take a microscope to the world and we look at ways in which what you think you're going to see when you look in that microscope is a little bit off. We typically we're not clueless, right? It's not that we're wildly off. The world's a hard place to figure out, and you know our beliefs about what we might see when we look through the microscope 
are often are are off a little bit, but but are often off in systematic ways. Systematic ways that that we could correct, we could be wiser about if we knew what reality actually looked like. And for the research that that we've been doing here on on what I refer to as under sociality, not being social enough for our own well being, you don't actually have to take my word for it. You want to do this yourself. Like I don't. You don't believe that talking to a stranger is going to be pleasant. You don't believe that when you pass along a compliment, you're going to light people up in ways that are surprisingly positive. You don't believe that when you reach out and express gratitude, that somebody will be blown away by it at a level you, you wouldn't have guessed. F that's fine. Just give it, a, give it a try. Like Run the experiments yourself. These effects are big and you, you can see them. And then you gain wisdom yourself. Right. Um, yeah. So that, that's what I hope people take from 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 this work. But I, I do have to say that as a researcher, I remain very focused on on trying to learn stuff. But I also have to say that I'm very happy when I show up at a place, you know, like the BDRM reception that Tim, you and I talked at and somebody who comes in essentially off the street isn't an academic, but comes in because they know some people starts telling me about my research and didn't know that I was the one responsible. So I, I consider that I consider that a big win when that happens. Oh. There's this guy who 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 yeah. who said it was a really good idea to talk to people, strangers on the train. <laughs> Nick, isn't that just amazing? Yeah. You should check out that research. Yeah. <laughs> you know about this? Yeah, I know about this. Exactly. Yeah. Nick, it is absolutely such a treat to have this conversation. We look forward to more in the future. But thanks today for being a guest on Behavioral Grooves. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me again. I look forward to the next one. You know, we're, we're definitely having you back when that book comes out. So there, there you go. Fun. I'm looking forward to it. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I share ideas on what we learned from our discussion with Nick, have a free flowing conversation and groove on whatever else comes into our mind working brains. Oh, that was lovely. That, that was, was a that was lovely. That was a great little bridge. Mind to, working to, brains. AC mind to use works, the brand mind, name. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. brought the brain and the mind, and they work. Hey, I'll, I'll, da -dun -dun. Yeah. <laughs> it is a bit boom chicky. I mean, you know, we we are we, so listeners. We're 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 going. We're going to be getting more and more video um, of of this stuff out here. We went to a. Uh, a podcast movement, big podcast convention, and they, they told us, oh, podcasters need to do more video. And Tim and I have been like, oh, all right, well, I guess we'll do that. But I was just trying to think like the little motion that I just did when I did that bump, bump, the boom, boom chick thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, <laughs> I don't think people I don't do not want to see that. Why would they want to see that? I don't know. I don't. Why, why would they, they want to hear it first in place there? But, or yeah. why would they want to see us? That's that's an important question in my mind. Well, but. they they like to look at that beautiful artwork that you have on the wall behind you. <laughs> blank walls, blank, <laughs> blank, blank, blank. Oh, all right, all right. Let's get moving. Um, it's what, always what a pleasure you... to talk to Nick. Right. Oh my. It's, he is what? fantastic. Oh, I just man. love, I, I could talk with Nick for hours because it just feels like you get nuggets of valuable information like every minute. Every, it's like, oh, that was cool. Oh, that was, that's even cooler. And it just keeps going and is going. Part of it's it like your, the, yeah, yeah. Is part of it your Wisconsin connection though? Like, like you've got this special groove jive, you know, thing. You know, us Wisconsin nights, you know. <laughs> or is my you know it, yeah okay yeah. Well, what, know. Did, what, let, let, what did you, what did you take away from our conversation with uh with nick what what is it that you want to groove Mine on first works is freaking cool yeah <laughs> this yeah. is you got the chance to see it i i haven't i'd read about it but i had not been there and i didn't really fully understand what it was meant for but man what a cool research facility that allows for not only the transmission of great insights to the general public about behavioral science and some of the other research, but yeah. as a research facility where you can bring in this very diverse group of participants and subjects that actually partake in these yeah. experiments and it can help research happen faster, more effectively, 
in in a very highly quality controlled environment. Yeah. And the the parenthetical that I, I kind of go back to is that he's got like demographics, uh, ethnicities and uh, races from 60 different countries, if I remember right, but not a big socio demographic difference because you have to have enough money to travel and stay in Chicago. So, yeah. so, okay. So it's not perfect, but it does open up the idea that in one week they're doing 400 experiments. It's like, wow. Like just gathering all this really cool data. I thought it was fantastic. I, yeah. This I idea too. of, you know, better sample size, better demographics, better research, better insights, all of that leads to better experiences in yeah. in life because behavioral science can help us all live better, more informed, purposeful lives. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. I think that behavioral science can help us. Like we talk about finding our, our groove, right? And yeah. keep the groove. And behavioral science is got all kinds of insights to help us get there that I that we miss out on if we don't like mention. like talking to strangers yes. is a net net gain for both you and the stranger yeah. when if you would have asked me without knowing the research i would have said hell no hell no <laughs> right yeah yeah i think i think that it's behavioral science that that asks the questions like what is it about your current job that you really love or would you rather be doing this job or a, or a different job? And to ask those kinds of questions is different than just a customer or, a, or an employee satisfaction survey. Mm -hmm. I feel like behavioral science digs deeper and, and that we start to get deeper into why we do what we do by, by using a behavioral science lens. I guess that's, that's really the, that's yeah, the key. And I think so again, this idea that behavioral science can help us understand our behavior better the point as nick and his research on talking with strangers i think is really like it puts that up on a pedestal because as i mentioned earlier i would not have assumed that without the knowledge i would have assumed yep. that yep. talking with a stranger it would probably be net neutral maybe net negative Mm -hmm. on that, even with the experiences that you and I have had about in the lift and other things. But in general, I shy away from that. And I would have made that assumption. The aspect that the research says, and again, any one individual conversation with a stranger is going to be, you know, an, an N of one and could be positive, negative. But on yeah. whole, what we know is that if I do this a hundred times, I will be better off because of that. Maybe most importantly, and, and you, you teed this up, Kurt, is that the assumption is that your intuition would be right. Mm -hmm. The assumption is that your intuition would lead you to the correct knowledge base. But the fact is that in our intuitions aren't always right. Yeah. And there and it's it's good to know when our intuitions lead us astray, when we have biases that that lead us to make less than optimal decisions. I, I will take like so this this research on talking to strangers and what you just said, the the assumptions that we have is is I'm gonna try to bridge back to the polarization series that we oh, released uh, a while ago, right? Mm -hmm. The the idea of the the what scientists call the meta perceptions of the other side. Yeah. We perceive the other side with these perceptions, but also we think about what they think about us, right? So when right. we're talking to strangers, it's not only about what we perceive to be our experience, but what we perceive the stranger's experience is going to be in that conversation. And right. both of those, we are widely off in our meta perceptions on average. This idea that, oh, the other side thinks is, is not going to want to talk to me or doesn't want to engage right. with me from a political spectrum, or that stranger isn't going to want to have a conversation with me. I'm going to be imposing on them. And that is really, I think, a key piece of what we're talking about. Uh, it, it absolutely is. Uh, and I, it also, of course, makes me think about our fantastic conversation with Kwame Christian. Oh, so and glad we do not pay him royalty. 
Oh my god, because we would owe him. <laughs> We're already poor enough with this damn this 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 podcast, but man, we would be like we would be bankrupt if if Listeners, we had to pay him a royalty every time we mentioned. If you have not checked out our conversation with Kwame Christian in episode one seventy eight, please do so. Uh, he's he has such a brilliant observation on the human condition and he's a negotiator. Like he's yeah. coming at this as a negotiator, but he says, if you start with compassionate curiosity, like real authentic interactions happen when we pay attention to people and get out of your self absorbed shadow and make an <laughs> effort to interact with somebody. Yes. It can, it's, it can have a positive effect on the whole world. <sighs> yeah. All okay. right. Kwame, That's- we'll send you your penny. There you go. Okay. Uh, so here's one we're grooving, right? So I'm going to groove that one other piece that Nick brought up that I thought is, again, one of those nuggets that I talked about is this idea that expectations can inhibit learning, uh, right? This idea, yeah. and, and I'm going to quote him here, said, one of the problems with our expectations is that they can sometimes inhibit our learning. In particular, kind of beliefs, the kind of beliefs that are really self-fulfilling and inhibit our learning more than other, you know, learning more than others. So this idea that yeah. the expectations we have of going into a conversation with a stranger then inhibit the ability to actually learn from that because we're going to be anxious or anxiety and we're not going to go in with compassionate curiosity mm-hmm. we're going to go in with this oh my god i'm bothering this person and therefore it's going to lead and i'm not going to have that opportunity to to experience that on a broader level i'm really glad you brought that up kurt on a broader level than just the perceptions and meta perceptions and the anxiety that we might have about the idea of talking to the stranger this idea that our expectations can inhibit learning hit me uh, uh, with sort of three things one is it reminded me of Lydie Klotz back in episode 125, where he says, rather than start by thinking that you have to add something, think about starting something by what you're going to take away, right? Think about reduction. Think about the having that expectation that I'm walking into a situation and I'm going to first see what I can eliminate. Uh, I think that that's a, a, a fantastic uh, expectation thing to right. Our to modify. expectation is to add. We can change that. We can change that. The second one is the old. Uh, <laughs> it's an old sales sales manager rune that I remember from when I was early in my my first job. That that my sales manager said, "Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right." It's like the little engine that could. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And then he could. There you go. Right. It wasn't. I don't think I can. I don't think I can. I don't think I can. Then he would have never made it up the up the hill. Right now, of course, we know that the world is more complex than just mindset and expectations. But and that that it takes more than just uh, you know. I think I can. You need engine you need a track you need power you need all those things to get all those that ill right but there is truth to that this idea that if you have all of those other pieces your mindset and how you think about what you're able to do can be the determining factor whether or yes. not you do it yeah yeah exactly so uh, that's that's where I want to just expand the idea behind thinking that maybe my interaction with a stranger could be good to thinking differently about a whole lot of things. Get over our intuitions, basically. Get over our intuitions. I like that idea. And I have to get over my insecurities or my, like, I, it, what, what, what is it? It's the G.I. Joe fallacy, right? That is knowing you know? is half of the battle, right? I, I need to talk to more strangers in my life. Yeah. And yeah. I, I I will I will make a pledge to you Tim and okay. to all of our groovers out there. I am actually hopping on a plane later today uh flying out to Seattle. Okay. And I will talk to the person sitting next to me in the plane. Bravo. Bravo. There we go. Will okay. you report back to us and let us know how that goes? Well, we'll see how it goes. Maybe, maybe <laughs> I will. Maybe I won't. I don't know. There we go. All right. So I'd like to close our comments on Nick with this, Tim. 
if you're going to find a groove that really works for you, it is probably going to involve other people uh, and not just people that you know now in this moment of your life. It is going to involve yeah. people who you don't know yet. And a very cool groove might mm -hmm. unfold in a conversation with someone who you don't know today, like the person I'm going to talk to on the airplane. <laughs> uh, well said. And we don't know unless we give it a shot. We have to take a chance. We've got to drop our expectations about what might go wrong. We just have to give it a try. Yeah, those expectations about what go wrong and we just turn that around, turn that frown into a smile, and what can go right with those expectations? Absolutely. Okay, Groovers. Oh my God, I don't believe I just said that. You okay, did. Okay, Groovers, did. we hope that you find yourself in a public situation soon and that you put some of Nick's work to the test. And of course, we hope that doing so helps you this week go out and find your groove.